is Francesco Spagnola, the curator of the Magnus Collection. Welcome to our pop-up exhibition series. The format of these exhibitions is pairing a presenter, and today we're honored to have Susanna Zajewski uh, with us, uh, a presenter with uh, objects from the collection that are typically in storage and that every week we uh, take out for public display, so they're out briefly and then they go back into the permanent storage. Um, today's presentation is about the Latino language and especially the Latino in Sarajevo and it's also about a recent documentary that uh, Susanna co-directed and that will be screened um, this coming month at the, at the Madness so please make sure that you take our uh, Sephardic identities on the screen uh, card that's on the, on the table in the back to see all the screenings of this series. Um, we put on display four items from the collection that all uh, represent the Latino language. Uh, two of them are from Venice. One of them is uh, from Turkey, but through India. It was, actually, it was actually collected in India. And the third one, we're still identifying the provenance, we suspect Salonika, um, so Eastern Mediterranean. Um, but uh, they all represent the various formats of the Latino language, which was initially used to create translations of Hebrew classical texts. And then to inter in illustrate those translations, you will, you will see in there a Passover Haggadah from printed in Venice in 1740, a primer to instruct children on how to learn Hebrew with instructions in Spanish, but all written in Hebrew characters, and also one manuscript that uses solitreo, which is the um, handwritten form of the Judeo-Spanish language. So all these documents are here for view, and after the presentation, uh, you're welcome to come and take a closer look. It's part of what we present today. But without any further ado, I want to just welcome Susanna Zajewski to our uh, series today. And her work will be featured here also in the coming months. So she's a, she's a speaker and, and a welcome presence for several weeks this uh, semester. Thank you, Susanna, for joining us and welcome. Your help. <laughs> this one? Ah, 
Oh, no, I'm trying to get out of PowerPoint. I'm trying to get to the video. language is that? Spanish? Not quite. It's Ladino. Judeo-Spanish. Judeo-Espanol, Spanolit, Judesmo, Judeo, Hakatia. This language goes by many names. It is a language of the Sephardic Jews. For centuries, the Jews inhabited the Iberian Peninsula, Sephardah in Hebrew. At the end of the 15th century, the Jews were expelled from Spain and Portugal. Many migrated to North Africa, and the majority settled in the Balkans, where Sultan Bayezid II welcomed them into the Ottoman Empire. These Jews, Sephardic Jews, spoke Judeo-Spanish, a language that developed greatly in the diaspora, with linguistic influences from many surrounding cities and their local languages. One such city was that of Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Sarajevo, or Sarai, was known for being a multi-religious city with Jews, Muslims, Catholics, and Orthodox Christians living together before World War II. Prior to the war, the Jewish population played an impressive role in both government and the workforce. However, over 80% of the estimated 12,000 members of the Jewish community of Sarajevo perished in a few short years, all starting in April 1941. Only a small portion of the community survived by the end of the war in 1945. What would become of the Sephardim and their language? Save My Language tells the story of Mores Salahari, a Sephardic Jew born in Sarajevo in 1930, who spoke Judeo-Spanish, Ladino, his mother tongue, to survive the Holocaust. UNESCO classifies Ladino as a highly endangered language. Every 14 days, a language disappears from the world. 50% of the world's languages will be extinct by the year 2100. We are facing a dramatic crisis of linguistic, cultural, psychological, and scientific losses when languages vanish. This is a story about how a language saved a young Bosnian boy's life during the Holocaust, and how it continues to be a part of his Sephardic culture and identity. <coughs> Russian is my first language. So when I got to Bosnia, if I couldn't communicate with people in English, 
I would use Russian because Serbo-Croatian or Bosnian, depending on how you want to call the language, is a Slavic language. There are many similarities to Russian, so I could understand certain things. But in this case, I wasn't using Russian. I was using modern Spanish to communicate to people who were speaking a Spanish from 500 years ago that had obviously changed over 500 years in some ways. And sometimes they would use Turkish words to describe things for which there were no Spanish words from 500 years ago. And sometimes there were Hebrew words, Arabic words, French words. And then there were words that I recognized from modern Italian, like they wouldn't say trabajar, which means uh, to work in Spanish, they would say laborar. In Italian, say laborar. They would say trocar for, for to change instead of cambiar. Like, trocar you can find in modern Portuguese. And it was a fascinating experience for me because I, I was, as I was born in the former Soviet Union in Russia, I can't call myself Russian because I'm not ethnically Russian and I'm, nor am I a resident of Russia. So I'm labeled as Jewish. That's considered to be my nationality or ethnicity. And in the, in the former Yugoslavia, people, unfortunately, after the fall of communism in, in the former Yugoslavia, were then, then had to refer to themselves based on their ethnicity. So be, during Yugoslavia, everyone was supposed to be Yugoslavian, but then after the fall, you were either Macedonian, Albanian, Serbian, Croatian, but there were mixtures of people. Like I have a friend whose mother, half Muslim, half Catholic, and his father's half Jewish, half, half Orthodox. So what is he? He's a mutt, right, of all these religious groups. And it's very difficult in, um, in Bosnia if you're mixed. Because there are, um, you know, you have to classify yourself as one thing or another. And even during the war, I was in high school, and my high school had this mock peace conference. I was living in Boston at the time, and my high school had to play the Bosnian Serbs, who were basically the aggress who were the aggressors during the war. And I was the religious leader, so I was pretty vilified at this mock peace conference. And I started, you know, I was reading a lot about the war, and I was reading about the history, and I could, it resonated with me. It resonated with me on a personal level because I could understand the difficulty of being identified based on your religion. And your religion is supposed to be your ethnic group. But religion was banned during communism. So it's pretty much ridiculous to be right, identified by something that you can't even practice or you may not know anything about or may know very little about. So with all that background, when I met these Latino speakers, I it was a fascinating experience for me because I have a background in languages and music. I speak eight languages. Now I speak Ladino. I learned it to, to make the film. By the way, if any of you read the Jay Weekly article that came out last week, it, the first line said, Susanna does not speak Ladino, but she made a movie about Ladino. That was a mistake. I do speak it. Uh, I had to learn it, obviously, to make the film. So I had this background in language, in music, and obviously um, cultural and, and ethnic connection. And here I was speaking to people in a modern language, and they were speaking to me in an older language. And that, for me, symbolized part of what is Jewish identity. That Jews in many parts of the world may not have the same common language in terms of English, Portuguese, Farsi, but there is the, the, the liturgical language, the prayer language, which is in Hebrew. But in this case, we weren't speaking in Hebrew, because I can't speak it, nor could they. We were speaking in two versions of, of Spanish. And that got me completely fascinated in, in, by, into the language. And, and then I started to learn more about what was happening with endangered languages. And I, I realized that there was something that I could contribute to this. And I have written a book about how to learn foreign languages using music and the media. And the reason music is very important when it comes to learning anything is because music activates more parts of your brain than language does. So how many of you are familiar with Dr. Oliver Sacks, who, you know, the Book Awakening, the movie, yes, you know, and unfortunately he passed away about six weeks ago, cancer. So his book, The Music of Celia, absolutely opened my eyes to the power of music. And that's what inspired me to write my own book, Language of Music, about learning languages through music and TV and radio. And the book was actually uh, dedicated to Dr. Sacks. And I realized that one of the ways that I was learning Ladino was through the music. Right now, unfortunately, the, the two main Ladino textbooks that were written are out of print. If you try to buy them on Amazon, they're exorbitantly expensive. You could spend that money and go to Turkey and live with the Sephardic community for like two months, and it would, it would be cheaper than buying the book. I happen to have a copy of the book because I bought it on Amazon three years ago, not knowing that 
I can make a fortune right now because I'm selling, but I'm not going to do that because I want my book. So what, what it is with music is that when music activates more parts of your brain than language does, you're more likely to remember something that you heard to a song than if you just read it in the book. So if you wrote down your grocery list, you might not remember it, but if you had it to a song, you'll remember it. That's why in school we have nursery rhymes, we have schoolhouse rock back when, you know, PBS, what was that, in the 70s and 80s, for people to remember things. I read about a physics professor at Haverford University who sings things about, uh, he, he actually takes modern songs and puts information about physics into his songs and he teaches it to the students. And I think he has a PhD from Princeton or Harvard. And many times when I talk about the role of music in pedagogy, people think, oh, that's just for little kids, that's just for kindergarten. We use it, you know, we use music every day. We have it in our, in our advertisements. The reason is because it sticks in our head. So I want to give you an example of a song and how this song helped me learn some of the pronunciation differences between modern Spanish and Ladino and also how I learned some of the differences in terms of the grammar. I want to ask first, how many people here speak Spanish or have a background in learning Spanish? So a couple people. So you might recognize this thing. So I'm going to sing this song. I just have to warn you, I'm not a professional singer. So, um, Sometimes when you get Judeo-Spanish 
speakers together, and they try to sing songs, and they'll say, no, you're singing it wrong. My grandmother sang it that way. No, 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 you're make, making that food wrong. My mom made it that way. And it's like, well, there's really no wrong answer. There are different dialects, there are different ways of singing music, and there are different ways of cooking food. Uh, another aspect you have right here is paloma. So in modern Spanish, you say paloma without the B. And here you have the B stem, so B, with the B instead of B. So I, my, one of my first entries into Ladino was actually through the music. Like I heard it in the synagogue, and then I went to um, a concert in Dubrovnik, in Croatia, when I was living in, in, in Bosnia. And I met my friend, Montserrat Franco, whose music we used in the film, and she was singing a lot of these songs. And that's what happens in this world. People get interested in languages through the music. There are people who listen to salsa music, they go out salsa dancing, and then they want to learn Spanish. So music is one of the ways to entice people to get interested in the language, and also as a way to document uh, the language. So I'm going to also talk about now modern musicians who, who, um, who compose in Latino. There's one, um, we have a couple, we have two people who sing in Latino that I know of in the Bay Area. One who's local, Luis Camado, I think she lives here in Berkeley. And uh, Kat Para, who lives in the South Bay, where I live. Kat Para, uh, she takes some traditional melodies, changes some of the arrangements to make them a bit more modern. Um, Yasmin Levy over here, her father was a very famous uh, Turkish Sephardic musician. And she, I think, performed in San Francisco Jazz, I don't know, five or six years ago. And she takes Ladino melodies and puts them to flamenco music, which is quite exciting. Uh, Sara Hueste, who is in New York, she makes uh, rock music with, with her own Ladino lyrics. And then my friend Montserrat Franco sings in a traditional way and used her music in the film. And one of the problems that some of these musicians have, like, for example, there's a musician in Liliana Benveniste in Buenos Aires. And she takes Latino music and she puts it to tango music. Okay, she's in Argentina, so it makes sense to have tango music. A lot of times these musicians get criticized. You're not singing how my grandmother sang it. That's not the traditional way. You are ruining my language by making it modern. You are doing something bad to my culture. And my response is, how many of you came here on a horse and a, horse and a buggy? How many of you use smartphones? How many of you are using blenders and food processors? Your grandmother wasn't using blenders and food processors. Yep? Yes, that's Ladino. But it looks like mostly Spanish to me. Well, the thing is, is that Ladino is a derivative of Spanish. But I would have expected more French and no. Arabic and, and... So the thing is, is that it depends on where you are. And there, these are traditional songs that are sung in different places. And some of these songs might date back to uh, when, the, when the Jews were kicked out of Spain in the 15th century. So you're not going to get the French, you're not going to get the Turkish, and you're not going to get um, some of the other languages which are regional. So you would have to look for a regional song, let's say from Greece maybe, to get some of, this, some of these variations um, of language. Yeah. But that's a good point, and people have asked me that before. So back to you know, the music issue is that if we want these languages to stay alive, there's innovation that has to happen. And other language groups, like Native American groups, other indigenous groups around the world, also have an issue with the younger people who are creating hip hop music, rap music, or you know, modern music in the language, and the elders are against it. But not everyone wants to sing the way their grandmother did. Like, I love the music of Cole Porter and Glenn Miller, but not many people my age do. And we're not in a zero-sum world that says, just because you're listening to Ladino and flamenco stuff, you can't listen to it the traditional way. We have room for variety. So I want to um, go back to the film. Control tab, right? Command tab. Okay. Yeah. There we go. I want to show you a clip of I'm going to show you a small scene from the film where the four remaining speakers of Ladino in Sarajevo 
talk about the role, talk about how they feel when they hear these cantigas, the word for songs or canciones, in Latino. Because for them, it's not how it is for me, it's a pedagogical tool. For them, it reminds them of what Sephardic life was in Bosnia before World War II, and it reminds them of how their mind was being lost.
So that's what Morris did. He took the stick, gave it to his dad, and his father made a hole, and his father said, go and run. And he was 11 years old. And this was a, a night in November, and I've lived in Yugos from Yugoslavia, and November can be very cold, especially at night. And I couldn't imagine being an 11-year-old just running out of the train by myself. And Morris ran out, met the music teacher, and the music teacher said, go to that truck over there, there's an Italian colonel, and the Italian colonel will help you escape from here. So the only way for him to communicate with the Italian colonel was through Ladino, because the Italian colonel didn't speak Serbocratian, did not speak German, for sure did not speak Hebrew. And the only way that Morris could figure out at the age of 11 to communicate with this guy was in a Latin language, in Ladino. So it was the first time that he saved his life. And that Italian soldier told him later on, you need to change your name, because you're not going to survive with a name like Morris al Bahari, because your surname is obviously not Christian, so it's either Jewish or it could be Muslim, but the Muslims in the former Yugoslavia would have, would be like al Baharovic or something like that. They would have a Latin, uh, sorry, Slavic ending to the name. So he changed his name to Milan Adamovic, which was the name of uh, one of his classmates who was uh, Serb Orthodox. And then he ended up spending about two months with the Italians, and he learned Italian, which was quite easy for him to learn because he already spoke Ladino. The other three that we see here, they, Ladino also helped them in the war. They were sent to Italian-controlled camps on the island of Gav on off the coast of Croatia. And so Ladino speakers had a much easier time communicating with the Italian soldiers because they had this common Latin language, whereas the Ashkenazi Jews most likely didn't speak Italian, and they didn't have that, that facility. And if you read stories about Spartan Jews who went to the concentration camps, they were usually at, at a disadvantage because they didn't speak Yiddish. Yiddish speakers could at least understand the German that was spoken by the Nazis. So this was a very unique situation where Ladino helped, helped these Jews. And Erebear keeps wanting me to go on the internet, but I wanted to talk to you guys about the film. So I'm going to show you one, um, one more clip about another instance where Ladino helped Morris survive in the war. And obviously, if you want to see the whole film, you need to come back in two weeks. So very quickly. Halifax plane. We live like like wolf in mountain, you know. And visit villages, give me for eating, everything, etc. Terrible time, terrible. I be alone. Only in villages, war, war, various partisans. If come Italian soldier or German soldier and Croatia soldier, I go in mountain and one week, two weeks alone, without nothing, eating grass, eating uh, fruits, and uh, that's terrible time. And I have only one monocle, you know, and Every morning when I wake up, I see villages. Where is partisan? I go in partisan radio. If it's German, I stay at home in, in mountain, alone. Morris told the villagers that he was an orphan called Milan Abanovic. While hiding in the mountains, Morris joined the partisan, the anti-Nazi grassroots movement led by General Josef Broz Tito. In 1944, Morris was 14 years old. He was in a field wearing his partisan uniform when he saw a Halifax plane with American and British pilots shot down. Five uh, men jumping with paracadut and come in field where I was. And I see Americans, I go, and when they see me, they glance, who are you? And I speak Spanish, which everyone does speak. Parlate italiano? No. Hablas en español? E un carinco, grincho. Dice, yo hablo español. 
who uh, mi dici tu sei, tu sei, I said, kept with red star, you know. You are partisan, not partisan, I am with partisan. <laughs> Can you tell me where is commandant, partisan commandant? Yes, I know. I didn't speak English. I used Ladino to speak the one, the Hispanic pilots in their groups, David Garino. That was my only way to communicate. Slavino saved my life in, in war. <coughs> Como? Hablas en español. Hablo porque yo soy sefardín. Uh, lo que es esto sefardín, no sabes nada. Lo que es esto sefardín. Esto es una parte, una parte de hebreos after, dopo la inquisición que escapada en Turquía eh, Parlando esto da, di, di, da mi storia. Non sai se non è that was young people don't study about that nothing. For I find it funny that more of those 14 year olds decided to give a history lesson to these pilots who probably really didn't care about the part of history, they just you know, wanted to stay alive. But that's that's kind of a sense of humor. So I think now I can ask I can take any questions, and I have copies of the DVD for sale if you want to buy it, I'll be out in the lobby afterwards. So, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Yes? Did any of the four adults have children, and if so, did they migrate outside of Sarajevo? Yes, um, all of them have children, and um, I think all of them live outside of Sarajevo, and none of them can speak with email. After World War II, and that's actually discussed in the film, the Sephardic Jews who came back did not want to be um, promoting their language. They wanted to be as Yugoslav as possible. So Morris, by the way, he would go by Boris. He would just change his name to Boris, which is a Slavic name, when Morris is not a Slavic name. Um, and to, so David Kami, he was the one that was on the left. His two kids live in Israel. Jakob Sinsi, I think his son lives in San Francisco. And Erna, I think her kids, they go between Spain and in Bosnia. Um, and Morris' son was in Croatia. Yes? Uh, so to what extent do you think the Sabdalenka influenced the Ladinovich? Uh, the, the I'm surprised you know about Sabdalenka. That's impressive. Actually, we have Sabdalenka music in the film. My my friend, Damir Mamovic, is... So Sabdalenka is a traditional form of Bosnian music. And it actually has Sephardic roots as well as Turkish roots. Um, but you would, you would, I would have to ask Daniel to give you that information because I'm not a Bosnian musicologist. But I'm very impressed that you know of that music. Any more questions? Yes? What does the uh, very endangered language? I'm sorry? You had said that the UN defined this as a very endangered language. What defined it as a very that's a good question. So a very endangered language has a very small amount of speakers, and there are no young people who speak it. So there are young people who are learning it, but it's not their uh, native language. And as I've noticed in various Latino communities that I've gone to, I've been in Turkey, most people are not teaching it to their kids. However, they lament the fact that the language is dying, but they're not doing much to keep it alive. And so some like, like Yiddish is less in danger than, than Latino because there are more Yiddish speakers. Yes. Yeah. I just want to mention that in Turkey there was a group of young people who were not from Latino that went back to the roots and to music. Uh, they were doing this all. That, that's one thing. The other thing is that just a few years ago in Turkey there was a group of Latino speakers and it kind of vanished. This is really interesting. Except for I read about that group because I was looking, Bay Area Latino speakers, I was trying to find people to speak to, and I found some articles from like 1996 about this group of people who got together. Um, yes, and in Turkey there are some music groups that, that do sing in Latino, for sure. But there is a motion in the state at the university that there is a very solid song. Yes, Devin Professor Devin Nahr is working on digitizing a lot of Latino texts in, in Seattle. There are two Latino communities in Seattle, one from Rose and the other one from 
start out somewhere, but somewhere in Turkey. Um, there's some, yeah? From museum. From museum, yeah. Um, there are also, there, there's a Latino conversation group in Washington, D.C. There's a small Latino community also in New York um, and in Los Angeles. My coworker on the film, Brian Kirshen, did his PhD at UCLA, and he was working with their center speakers at in Los Angeles. Yeah? There's a Latino um, singer in Berkeley, Luba Davis, um, oh. and she has a, um, an ensemble. They perform mostly in the She lives between Berkeley and Martin Singer, but they're incredible. Um, what was the name they're of her? Recorded. I'll give you a link if you Great. want. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's beautiful. She's very interesting. She's uh, not too far at all. Well, it's interesting because the music I was playing before you came in by Judy Frankel, she was a local, I think she was from the East Bay, she was an Ashkenazi Jew who sang in, in Latino. So I'm finding it's quite common actually that it's the Ashkenazi or non-Jews who are more interested in Latino than the Sephardim themselves. For example, one of the books about, uh, it's called The Manual of Judeo Spanish, written by a French woman called Marie Cecilia Bajal. She was, she was, she's married to a uh, Sephardi Jew from Turkey, but she's not Sephardi herself. And her book is one of the main books to learn the language. I think Lily does have kind of part of her Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know. Yeah. I think she'll be here. I'm hoping she'll be here when you're filming in a couple of weeks. So. Fantastic. And I can be there. Great. Any more questions or comments? Yeah. Could you say a bit more about um, this impact of music on learning, whether it's learning languages or, uh, in this case, let's say, learning languages? Because I've not really seen a movie, and I feel like I'm intrigued by the observation. Sure. So I have to explain. Professor Breslauer was my professor here like 20 years ago <laughs> when I was in, in Cal um, in a Soviet politics class. So what happens when we, we learn something to a song, we're just more likely to remember it. It's because of the way it activates the brain. So the, the advantages for language learning specifically are that you learn the pronunciation very quickly. Whereas if you're learning, if you're looking at a book and you have phonetic explanation of how to say something, or sometimes they have these pictures of how you're supposed to move your mouth. I mean, I had that for, for Portuguese, and I couldn't even understand where the tongue was because of the pictures. It just didn't make any sense to me. But when I heard the song, a song in Portuguese, I just copied what I heard. So it's very natural as children that the way we learn is we copy what we hear. So we're hearing for about a year before we start speaking. And there was work done by Alfred Tomatis, who was a French uh, ear doctor, and he wanted to understand why people have accents. And what he realized is that people have accents many times because they can't actually hear the thing correctly. And when you're in a language class, the first day of the language class, you learn hello, how are you, so on and so forth. If you've never heard a rolled R, for example, like you have in Spanish, and you come into the class and you're supposed to say, mi nombre es Carlos, you're going to say, mi nombre es Carlos can't roll the R if you've never heard it. So the idea of using music is that you hear it first, and then you see the written form later. And that's actually something that's very important, is that we, when we read, we're reading from our language. So we think, like for example, like the J, like I showed with ish, hija, we're going to read that as a sh, as a hija, h sound for Spanish speaker. But if you hear the song first, and you hear that it's actually isha, it's stuck in your head, and then when you read it, you, you make the connection to what's in your head and what's on the paper. So that's a huge importance of, of music in helping people learn language. But then you could use it for other subjects. Like, for example, you can make a song about Brezhnev. I don't know if you really want to, but, you know, like some sort of Brezhnev, Brezhnev blues or something. And you take some blues song and you change the lyrics and it sticks in the head, and it sticks in the student's head. I met a science teacher who took a Lady Gaga song and it was explaining things about molecules and cells to step seventh graders. Kids were going to remember the Lady Gaga song, but probably weren't going to remember too much about the text. So it's a huge pedagogical tool, and I hope more professors use it here in Berkeley. Hopefully. And here's, I know we have someone from the music department who's like, yeah, I know, I know we use it. <laughs> Any more questions or comments? Well, I hope to see you on Thursday, November 3rd at 7 o'clock. We'll show the film, and there's also going to be another film about, it's a silent film about the Jews in Spain.
Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. You get a copy of the Magnus catalog, a copy of the Jewish world. Wow. Everyone rolled up in one book. Thank, Thank you. you very much for